Hi, I want to talk about preeclampsia. Preeclampsia. Have you heard about that before? Or are you pregnant and you've been diagnosed with preeclampsia? Or a friend or anyone? Okay, let's go. Preeclampsia is mostly diagnosed after gestational age of 20 weeks up till postpartum period. 20% of preeclampsia cases will be before term, while 80% will be at term. There is possibility of pre-existing abstention, that is before pregnancy, or this abstention is actually due to the pregnancy called gestational abstention. Sometimes there will be new onset of proteinuria, and it may be without proteinuria. So the fact that there's no proteinuria doesn't mean there's no preeclampsia. It is a multisystemic disorder and it resolves after delivery. Significant end organ damage or dysfunction is found here. If it is not well treated, it will lead to another problem called eclampsia. Eclampsia is a form of grandma scissors in pregnancy. Now, here's the question. Anyone could have been diagnosed with scissor disorder and have grandma scissors, but why is that different and is given a different name? Yes, it is eclampsia if the grandma scissors is occurring in a pregnant woman who had been diagnosed with preeclampsia earlier, or sometimes because some women will not visit the clinic while pregnant, I mean for natural purpose, they may not have that diagnosis of preeclampsia, and the first thing that will bring them to the attention of any physician is actually the eclampsia. But it remains eclampsia if this woman is not having any neurological disorder before now and she has not been diagnosed with scissor disorder before pregnancy but today she's having grandma scissors and she's pregnant then this is eclampsia her syndrome is linked to preeclampsia but some authorities will not agree because some felt that f syndrome is a different diagnosis on its own without being linked to preeclampsia. Well, I will not talk in details about F syndrome anymore here because I have made a separate presentation on F syndrome. My advice at this juncture is that you check out my presentation on F syndrome. The pathophysiology is not that straightforward, but we can say that there are maternal and fetal or placental factors. Placental secretion of anti-angiogenic factors, that is SFLT1 and endoglin, that binds vascular and endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor in the maternal circulatory system. That appears to result in widespread maternal vascular dysfunction leading to abstention, proteinuria, and clinical manifestations of preeclampsia. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, the center is the blood pressure. And when the blood pressure is greater than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, that is systolic greater than 140 and diastolic greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, and this is a pregnant woman, and this is the first time she will have this type of problem, then we are dealing with preeclampsia. This blood pressure must be taken at least two different visits and not less than four hours apart. Like I said, this is a pregnant woman and at 28 week or greater. And we must be sure that this woman had never been diagnosed with abstention, 
that the blood pressure has been normal before pregnancy. So we will look out for new onset of proteinuria, low platelets, less than 100,000 microliter per microliter, increased liver enzymes, and creatinine. So, we are still on diagnosis. This patient is pregnant. This gentleman is pregnant. Now, more than 20 weeks gestational age. There is proteinuria. Creatinine is high. Liver enzymes are high. There's pulmonary edema. The lower limbs are edematous. The privilege is dropping. She's having headache, blood vision, flashing lights. Vomiting, upper abdominal pain, scotomata. The BP is rising. The fetus is not growing well. Intrauterine growth restriction, hydros vitalis, or we are even in trouble with our brachial placenta. There's an entity called severe preeclampsia, formerly called fulminant preeclampsia. At this stage, the blood pressure will be very high. Systolic of greater than 160 and diastolic greater than 110. Sudden and severe headache blood vision, nausea, vomiting, confusion, shortness of breath, renal failure, and pulmonary edema. At this stage, the next thing is to get out the baby. There are many risk factors, and one of them is doliparity. That is not to say that multipara women cannot have Preeclampsia, I'll talk about that in a bit. But the Nolipara will likely, most of the time, come down with preeclampsia more than the Morte. Black race. Intrauterine fetal death in previous pregnancy. New partner. Some hypothesize that immunological changes with new partner is also a possible risk factor. Obstructive sleep apnea, post traumatic stress disorder, lead poisoning, those living in very old houses or depending on the occupation. Other risk factors are autoimmune diseases like systemic lupal erythromatosis, antiphospholipid syndrome, and Positive family history of preeclampsia will give you predisposition for a plan for preeclampsia in your own time. Previous preeclampsia or past history of preeclampsia in previous pregnancies. Let me explain that. This is a woman who had been diagnosed with preeclampsia in the past. She's pregnant right now. There's that possibility of coming down with preeclampsia again. Kidney disease, or some call it renal disease, abstention, either pre pregnancy or chronic abstention. So, anyone who had been diagnosed with abstention before pregnancy, then the risk of having preeclampsia in pregnancy is higher. Obesity or high body mass index and teen pregnancy less than 18 years of age is a big factor in having preeclampsia. Old age, I mean at 35 or 40 before being pregnant, the individual might come down with preeclampsia. Gestational diabetes mellitus is a risk factor and multiple gestations like twins, triplets, and so on is a big factor as well. Long gap between pregnancies. Okay, let me explain that further also. Like if 
you are determined to have three kids and you have one in 2001 and you are having the second one in 2007, it's likely that you have preeclampsia. Either because you have preeclampsia in the first pregnancy or because the gap is so wide and your body is just behaving like as if you are pregnant for the first time. So long gap between pregnancies, like someone who had pregnancy in 2001 and the other one in 2002 or 2003 may not be at risk of preeclampsia compared to those who have a very long gap in between. Assisted reproduction, or all these in vitro, whatever will also add to that risk. Investigations. We do complete blood counts, do liver function tests, liver enzyme as a urinalysis, creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, albumin to creatinine ratio, and uric acid. Okay, treatment. When it comes to preeclampsia, these are the ways to go. One, if this is a time pregnancy, this is 37 weeks and beyond, whether severe or mild, delivery right away, deliver right now. So the woman is having preeclampsia. Lucky enough, we are not yet having eclampsia, but she's time already, gestational age 36 weeks and above. Whether this is mild preeclampsia or severe, deliver right away. Okay, two, this is a severe preeclampsia with all the neurological symptoms. You can check what I've said earlier on severe preeclampsia. So we are able to pick that in this woman, then stabilize this pregnant woman and delivery right away. Deliver that baby right away. Before wheeling her into the tether, check for airway, check for any foreign body, any discharge along the orifices and suction as may be appropriate. Check the breathing, O2 sat, respiratory rate, chest deformity, oscotate per course, chest moving with respiration and abdomen, any cyanosis centra or peripheral. Then check for the circulatory system, the vital signs at this point, the blood pressure, the heart rate, level of dehydration and put up your IV fluid, your bladder catheterization and fluid in and out level, output level, then continue monitoring the mother while the tether is being prepared. Fitter monitoring every one hour as well, use appropriate intravenous fluid. The target here is to prevent seizures. Magnesium sulfate could be used for this purpose as well. Okay, three. This is mind preeclampsia. Then the management will be expectant one here. We have to educate the woman on the diagnosis, the possible line of treatment, and the outcome, the prognosis. So we have to stabilize this woman. If she's living close by, that determination should be made whether she'll be allowed to go and be coming on a daily basis or not. It depends on the protocol at your center. Stabilize if this is between gestational age of 34 to 36, you may admit. You send consult to your obstetrician, monitor and weigh every day. Urinalysis, blood pressure, use Doppler to monitor the fetal heart rate and make sure both the mother and the fetus are doing good. If not, the line of treatment can change immediately to see the best way to get the baby out.
like I said, severe preeclampsia we were around close monitoring, fluid input and output around every 12 hours, vital signs every one hour, fetal heart rate continuously. If you are dealing with high blood pressure here, you are free to use either labetalol, adralacine, or nifed the pain if she can still take her aura. And to prevent seizures, I've mentioned it just a while ago that you can use magnesium sulfate. So you are going to continue using magnesium sulfate to postpartum period. Why? Caesar is still present or possible up to 24 to 48 hours post delivery. So continue your magnesium sulfate while the woman is being wheeled to observation room and continue checking the vital signs every one hour. Preeclampsia may be early, that's less than 34 weeks gestational age, and that will have severe or poorer outcome. If it is late, that's greater than 34 weeks gestational age, well, we may have a better outcome. The prognosis. To the fetus, the responsibility of fetal birth. You can imagine it. If this is severe preeclampsia, whether the fetus is term or not, is no longer our problem. Severe preeclampsia, we are glad the mom is still alive, not yet, not having grandma's scissors. Then the next thing is to take the baby out. So if this baby is not term yet, there's going to be preterm birth. And intrauterine growth restriction because of the high blood pressure, there's no enough going to the child in utero. And there's possibility of intrauterine fetal death as well. So the fetus may suffer orders. The mother, hmm. there's possibility of severe hemorrhage. With severe hemorrhage, there's what we call Sheehan syndrome, and that is pituitary apple functioning, apple pituitarism, because of massive blood loss. Might be from a bloodstream placenta, or later on, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. She's bleeding everywhere, and the woman could even develop scissors like eclampsia now. A cancer cells in scissors with the sequelae. She can go into coma and she might have F syndrome. A possibility of stroke when there is massive bleeding into the brain, hemorrhagic stroke here, and there's possibility of death. So this is a serious matter that we need to take as such. In conclusion, if preeclampsia is well managed, it will not progress to eclampsia. Regular antenatal clinic attendance is very important because that will afford your physician the time, the opportunity to make that determination that you are having preeclampsia. And once that is done, you will be able to seek the services of the experts to help you. And decision for possible elective surgery could be taken quickly enough before you come down with any of those possible complications that may not be too well. I'm wishing all affected pregnant women well partake in antenatal visit, check out my presentation on antenatal visit, your first antenatal clinic, and kindly remember to subscribe to this channel. Thank you.